Hey guys, Tyler here. Blade Runner is one of the most influential sci-fi franchises of all time. Based on Philip K. Dick's 1968 novel, Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep? The first film, directed by Ridley Scott, is considered a cult classic and is credited with helping launch the cyberpunk genre. Set in a dystopian future Los Angeles, the film and its sequel, Denis Villeneuve's Blade Runner 2049, follow special police personnel called Blade Runners. These personnel hunt down and kill fugitive so-called replicants, a process referred to as retiring them. The replicants are created by the Tyrell Corporation to serve as slave labor, especially in the off-world colonies, which are aggressively advertised to the miserable masses on Earth. As the first film is set in the year 2019, a year that has since come to pass, Blade Runner, in a way, qualifies as a kind of alternate history. In this video, I'd like to examine the socioeconomic, political, and technological factors that form the basis of this alternate history, and answer the question, is it really so different from reality? Let's find out. A good starting point, in my view, is to define what exactly a replicant is, as the pop culture perception of their identity has been rather nebulous. I should mention too that throughout this video I will include information from across the Blade Runner franchise. Not just the movies, but also novels, comics, the video game, the anime adaptation, and so on. But I'll be sure to make it clear what I'm referencing. Oh, and by the way, obviously spoilers for all of this stuff. If you haven't seen the films, I do highly recommend them. While the original novel calls these synthetic beings androids, this term is purposefully not used in the 1982 film. Replicant was chosen by Scott to discourage preconceived ideas by the audience. As a matter of fact, replicants are genetically engineered, biologically enhanced, people with superior capabilities made up entirely of organic substance. Indeed, the motto of their manufacturer, Tyrell, is more human than human, a phrase appropriated by renegade replicants in both films, while sometimes referred to pejoratively as skinners or skin jobs, they are virtually indistinguishable from non-engineered humans. That is, except for the fact that replicants are designed to lack empathy, making them textbook sociopaths. The first replicants were introduced in the year 2000, at least according to the comics continuity. According to all versions, Tyrell's Nexus line of replicants are virtually identical to adult humans, but have superior strength, speed, agility, resilience, and to varying degrees, intelligence, depending on the model. The Nexus 6 model, introduced by 2018, is programmed to live for a designated four years. This limitation, designed as a kill switch to prevent replicants from developing empathy, leaves replicants emotionally inexperienced as they lack a framework to deal with their emotions. This prompts multiple replicants to revolt and negotiate the terms of their designated lifespan. Some replicants are given to people who accept an offer to immigrate to the off-world colonies, while others are used in combat to protect colonists and explore new worlds. The first film's opening crawl states that after a bloody mutiny against an off-world colony is staged by a Nexus 6 combat team, the manufacturing of replicants is banned on Earth with some exceptions. As replicants are not seen as human and are afforded no rights or protections, the Blade Runners are assigned to hunt down and retire them. It's unclear when the Blade Runner units were established. The comics continuity states that it was in 2009 after the murder of a Tyrell employee named Lydia Kine, blamed on a Nexus 4 and prompting extensive redesigns. But in any event, they're in place by 2019. Replicants are so similar to humans that most regular people can't tell them apart, notwithstanding the fact that it's often safer for a replicant to pretend to be a regular human and keep their true identity a secret. A replicant can be detected using the Voight-Kampff test, which is introduced by name 
in the original novel. The test attempts to provoke emotional responses to a series of emotionally charged and sometimes disturbing questions. Replicants' nonverbal responses are different from a standard human's, particularly the dilation of their pupils. According to Rick Deckard, played by Harrison Ford, typically a replicant can be spotted after 20 or 30 questions. But sometimes replicants can be very difficult to spot. Again, we are talking about flesh and blood beings, not robots. In order to give replicants an emotional cushion to make them more controllable, Tyrell Corporation's founder and CEO, Eldon Tyrell, sought to upgrade replicants by implanting them with memories of a false past. As a demonstration, Tyrell created Rachel, a Nexus 7 replicant implanted with the memories of Tyrell's niece. In the first film, Rachel believes herself to be human, before Deckard determines she is, in fact, a replicant. Blade Runner 2049 also confirms that Rachel was an experimental reproductive model who ultimately conceives a daughter with Deckard. She dies during childbirth in 2021 due to complications, but according to Tyrell, she has an open-ended lifespan. This feature, as well as ocular implants for easier identification, is included in Nexus 8 models, rushed onto the market in 2020 until they are discontinued three years later. So the movie replicants are clearly not androids in the traditional sense. Androids are humanoid robots that, while often covered in a fleshy outer material, are more fully artificial in nature when it comes to their insides. The line between human, android, cyborg, robot, and other related terms does tend to blur in science fiction and even in real life, but to me it's clear that the replicants are basically basically clones. They're genetically engineered rather than fully designed from scratch. They're more human than human, but they're also designed to be subservient. They fulfill jobs that are deemed inappropriate for humans, including the aforementioned hazardous conditions of the off-world colonies for exploration and combat, as well as professions like prostitution. Indeed, the pleasure model replicants are one of the chief exceptions to the ban in place on Earth after 2018. In terms of real-world research and technology that could have gone into this, well, we've been cloning animals for decades, and manipulating the human genome has been a fascination of ours for much, much longer. As Nyander Wallace puts it in Blade Runner 2049, Every civilization was built off the backs of a disposable workforce. Thus, replicants offer a way for humanity to continue this trend without it being explicitly defined as slavery. The replicants are a paradox, simultaneously subhuman and superhuman. If that doesn't scream eugenics, I don't know what does. But as for Blade Runner's take on true artificial intelligence, well, that's a separate topic entirely. In Blade Runner 2049 and its anime prequel, Blade Runner Blackout 2022, as well as various tie-in materials, we learn that not too long after the events of the first film, a group of replicants and at least one human sympathizer detonate an electromagnetic pulse, or EMP, on the West Coast. This EMP event, later referred to as the Blackout, is carried out to erase the Replicant Register, used to hunt down replicants by vigilantes after the Blade Runner units were shut down. The Blackout damages or deletes untold amounts of data, knocking out most of the planet's financial institutions and industries. Afterwards, the global food supply dwindles down to a dangerously low level. In 2023, a prohibition is put in place on replicant production, except of course for the pleasure models. All Nexus 8 models are mandated to be retired, but some, including Sapper Morton, go into hiding. In 2025, technologist and inheritor of billionaire daddy money, Nyander Wallace, solves Earth's food crisis by genetically engineering new crops. His company, the Wallace Corporation, surges in influence as a result. Wallace purchases the now defunct Tyrell Corporation in 2028, and during the 2030s, 
Wallace makes advances in replicant technology, making them more obedient than the Tyrell models. By 2036, he convinces the government to lift the ban, and by 2049, millions of replicants have been reintroduced into production. However, this is still not enough to meet the demand for billions of replicants to help facilitate rapid space colonization. This leads Wallace to turn to biological reproduction in replicants, at this point a lost technology. Digital companions, or digis, are fully customizable holographic companions designed by the Wallace Corporation. One brand of digi is Joy, and in Blade Runner 2049, Kay has a Joy domestic partner. Specific features such as eye color, hair color, and clothing are variable from instance to instance. Joy has a variety of vocal intonations and can adopt accents. When we first meet her, she even greets Kay as a 1950s housewife, a commentary on social stratification in the Blade Runner universe. Joy requires a projecting device to manifest, such as the ceiling-mounted projector in Kay's apartment, or the building scale advertising projector seen later in the film. Another option, though, is the portable emanator, which allows Joy to travel with her user. Of course, Digi's artificial intelligence and elegant interplay between advanced hardware and machine learning software raises lots of questions about the nature of consciousness. Are Digi's really just glorified virtual assistants? Or could they potentially represent a new front in the fight for personhood in the Blade Runner universe? In real life, machine learning is capable of truly remarkable feats, but as I've talked about before on this channel, we're a long way off from developing true artificial general intelligence, the ability of a machine to learn and perform a variety of human-level tasks. There's still so much much that we don't understand about the human brain, and a bevy of engineering hurdles and socioeconomic factors make a singularity in the 21st century very unlikely in my opinion. But what conditions could have supported the level of technological advancement we see in Blade Runner? The oft-referred-to off-world colonies in Blade Runner are a huge mystery. We've never seen one in either of the films, and it's unclear what the conditions of the colonies are actually like. They're advertised on blimps and other places as a grand opportunity to begin again in a golden land of opportunity and adventure. Of course, as you can imagine, evidence points to life in the colonies not being so rosy, as the replicants are designed to survive dangerous, harsh labor and environments, and some are purpose-built for combat, it's no surprise that even despite the truly bleak conditions of 2019 Los Angeles, off-world colonization still requires intense promotion and considerable financial incentives. Replicants like Roy Batty recall horrific off-world experiences, including deadly battles in outer space. No doubt there are probably some habitats for the ultra-rich that do support a luxurious lifestyle, but it's also never specified whether off-world colonization is limited to our solar system or incorporates interstellar travel. Now, to many, that probably seems like a very easy distinction to make. After all, Blade Runner and Blade Runner 2049 are set in the first half of the 21st century. So why assume interstellar travel is feasible at all, despite the other technological advances we see on screen? Well, there is some evidence to back up this claim. Many fans point to the 1998 film Soldier, starring Kurt Russell. Written by David Peoples, who also wrote the script for Blade Runner, Soldier is considered by the filmmakers to be a spiritual successor and spin-off sidequel to Blade Runner, implying both may exist in a shared universe. Soldier features numerous aspects of the Blade Runner continuity, such as the flying cars called spinners, as well as the space battles referred to by Roy in his dying monologue, the shoulder of Orion, and the so-called Tannhauser Gate. A deleted scene from Soldier confirms the Tannhauser Gate to be a warp station, allowing access to habitable 
planets outside our star system, possibly in other galaxies. Shit, is this, is this where the connection between THX 1138 and Star Wars comes in? Harrison Ford cinematic universe. This is the only conceivable way, in my view, that a 21st century society could engage in interstellar travel. But these connections also feel like a bit of a stretch, especially since the Tannhauser Gate's true properties are not explicitly outlined in the final cuts of Blade Runner or Soldier. Even colonizing our own solar system this fast would require, arguably, humongous leaps in technology. But perhaps not as humongous as you might imagine. As NASA's Apollo program drew to a close, the question of where the agency would set its sights next was largely settled. Development of the space shuttle concept began in the late 1960s, with funding approved in 1972. But subsequent proposals, such as George H.W. Bush's Space Exploration Initiative and George W. Bush's Vision for Space Exploration, laid out concrete timelines to land human astronauts on Mars in 15 to 30 years. All of these plans experienced setbacks, and even today, while the Artemis program promises to return humans to the moon as early as 2024, there's currently no planned date for a crewed Mars mission, though one can hope that we are actually closer this time. Clearly in the Blade Runner universe, the timeline of human space exploration is completely different. Various tie-in media places the beginning of the off-world colonization program in the late 1990s, and some have suggested this may have been preceded by a lucrative asteroid mining program, kicking the alternate history theorizing into high gear. Perhaps in the wake of Apollo, more funding, both public and private, was allocated globally towards space exploration, both manned and unmanned. I emphasize the private part because of the obvious corporatocracy that runs Earth in this timeline. Immense mineral wealth from the asteroid belt would have facilitated advances in consumer technologies, which is why we see widespread advertisements for companies like Sony and Atari. This and other factors could have also helped Japan avoid their economic economic recession, perhaps pitting them against the United States and the surviving USSR as a third global superpower in the 21st century. The ubiquity of East Asian influences on the American West Coast is a frequent trope in cyberpunk settings, hence the common sight of Japanese signage on buildings in LA and Asian American characters and background extras in Blade Runner. NASA has had plans for a manned base on the moon for decades, and along with traveling to Mars, besides the necessary advances in radiation shielding, one of the chief barriers to expansion is cost. But clearly, something compelled Earth's governments and corporations in Blade Runner to prioritize space travel over, for example, social spending. And the hyper-industrialization of the planet would have exacerbated climate change to the extent that we see in the films. The initial off-world colonies may have been domed settlements on the moon and Mars, or even orbital habitats, all achievable with modern modern-day technology, and the nine new worlds mentioned in Blade Runner 2049 could be moons of the gas giants, reached in a matter of years or even months with advanced nuclear or ion propulsion technology that we can envision today. Blade Runner as a franchise is a lot deeper than many might initially suspect. It tackles complex themes like the dangers of technological progress and what it means to be human. Indeed, between the setting's cyberpunk aesthetics, environmental degradation, corporate domination, and arguments over who gets to have rights, is it really so different from today's world? I'm curious to hear your thoughts on this and everything else I've talked about in this video down below. With that, thank you all so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to leave a thumbs up down below and don't forget to share it. That stuff really helps me out. 
If you haven't subscribed yet, be sure to do that as well so you won't miss future uploads, and click the bell icon to receive all notifications. If you want to support my work even further, becoming a patron or a member is a great way to do so. Links to those, as well as my social media and merch store, are in the description. That's all I have for this week. I'll see you next time.